Great. All right. Why don't we uh, get started then? Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Tom Quinn. I'm the head of analysis and insights at the offshore and renewable energy catapult, uh, which is the UK's leading innovation and research centre for offshore renewable. Uh, I'm joined today by a, an all-star panel who I'll introduce shortly to discuss the fascinating and very important topic of uh, macro scale wind weights. So we'll look to provide a beginner's guide to how these large scale wake effects work before delving into the question of whether okay. regulators, policymakers are prepared and equipped to tackle um, tackle the legal and marine spatial planning ramifications. So just in order of appearance today, each of the panelists will have um, about eight to 10 minutes to, to talk about their, their subjects. Uh, we'll follow up with a bit of a, a panel discussion afterwards in the Q&A session. So in order of appearance, we'll have Ken Casriel. So Ken has worked in the energy industry since uh, 19, 1995. After an initial career as a journalist, uh, including with The Economist Group, Ken, a bit like myself, worked for many years as an oil and gas analyst. Uh, in 2020, he saw the light and started looking at wind energy, and he's co-authored with uh, ORA Catapult, the online course, Ultra Wind Economics for Complete Beginners. And he joined our team as an economist last year. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Nikolai Nygaard. He is a senior lead specialist for wind resource assessment at Orsted. Um, he's a technical expert. He's been writing about, about this topic in journals since 2015. Uh, he'll discuss some technical basics in hopefully layperson friendly terms, as been promised, uh, and also cover how Orsted deals with the issue. Next up, we'll have uh, Eirik. Uh, Eirik's in the law, uh, law facility, law, law faculty at the University of Bergen in Norway. He's the co-author co of a new peer-reviewed paper, which will be released this month, um, on which he collab collaborated with various uh, wind research experts. Um, it'll be summarizing the paper, Gone with the Wind, has wind has farm induced wakes and uh, yeah, wind farm induced wakes and regulatory gaps, which in his words assesses both the physical and legal nature of transboundary wake effects, which may occur between offshore wind farms. So that's uh, effectively the, the topic for today. Next, we'll have KK Davide. Uh, KK is professor of law at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. Uh, she's the author of I think at least two journal articles on wind wakes, and we'll speak on the extent to which the issue of generation losses from neighboring farms wakes is on the radar of US regulators, investors, and financiers. Um, following KK, we'll have Tim Pick. Tim was until recently the UK offshore wind champion, and he's now chair of the offshore wind growth partnership, um, which provides strategic capability assessments, advisory services, and grant funding to facilitate shared growth between developers and the supply chain. Uh, Tim has a background as an energy and infrastructure transaction lawyer, and will be uh, talking briefly on the way we can think about wakes from a legal and regulatory perspective, uh, both within countries and between countries. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, Stuart Gordon. Stuart is a lawyer with Adelschall Goddard, which has lots of experience in, uh, in the renewable energy sector. Uh, Stuart has real world experience of this, having been kind of at the sharp end of the topic. Uh, he'll summarize an agreement he helps negotiate between two developers, um, providing for compensation due to losses caused by each other's wind waves. Uh, so that's our very esteemed panel. Uh, following that, we'll have yeah, actually some time for a, a panel discussion to open it out. And, um, and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. So Zoom has a Q&A function. Please add your questions to that. Uh, we'll try and get to as many as possible, but if we don't manage to cover them all, we should be able to follow up afterwards, um, uh, get in touch with some responses. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll hand over to Ken to give us a bit of an introduction. Thanks very much, Tom. Let me share my screen here. Do I assume correctly that you see my screen? Yeah, in full sure. screen. That's great. Okay. Um, for folks who are new to this topic, I'd like to give a high level introduction to give some context to the other presentations. So here are some points that I'll be scratching the surface of. What we see here within a farm 
the turbines in the front row are doing their job. They're extracting energy from the wind and leaving behind it a trail or a wake of slower and more turbulent wind. The slower wind impacts, reduces the generation of the turbines in the second row who also slow down the wind and then pass the effect down the row. This is not news. Developers have allowed for this um, for a very long time. What is more of an emerging topic are wakes between farms. This is a simulation under very specific conditions. And we see a few things here. We saw the intra-farm wakes, which were just depicted. We see this new thing, the intra-farm wake. And this might surprise you, but the wind does slow down on the approach as well. So all three of these influence generation. This is a simulation of the New York bite area, and you can see steep reductions in mean wind speed. This was published in March on LinkedIn by RWE. I'm going to let you read this. I'll pace it because um, it's faster than me reading it aloud. Now, bear in mind that that's just in one specific set of circumstances. What I found is that I was, as I was looking through the literature, I was struggling for ways that I, as a non-technical person, could come up with a, a rough and ready rule of thumb, on average, how long does it take for the wind speed to recover? And the deeper I got into my quest, the more I found, um, well, it's not rocket science, but it's part atmospheric science and is best left to people like Nikolai Nygaard and not Ken Casriel. Because there's lots of moving parts here. There's the ambient wind speed. There's the layout, the wind directions, and these two go together. In this notional layout, wind blowing from the west creates eastward uh, waves. The wind speed plummets right past the rotor and by the end gets back to where it was. No other farm, uh, no other turbines are in the path, so no other turbines were harmed in the making of this presentation. However, in this layout, we see the rotor speed. And in my own private term, I call it a compound wake. So how do we depict wind direction? We use what's called a wind rose. Each petal of the rose shows the percentage of the year that the wind blows from a particular direction. And so for a year, they'll all sum up to 100%. For example, here we have wind blowing from the north towards the south for 6% of the year. And from the southwest to the northeast, for 12% of the year. And these, of course, will vary from site to site. This was from somewhere in the North Sea. This more bipolar distribution was from Taiwan. It's quite interesting. All of these will not be built. Most, most of these are purple. Um, but the predominant wind direction for much of the year is blowing right through these and potentially between them. And for the other not insignificant part of the year, the direction reverses, meaning potentially you can have weights within these clusters and between these clusters coming and going, excuse me. You also have to consider the kit that is in place and the atmosphere. This requires looking at the world through two lenses. This is a zoom in from this. This is the micro scale. This is the meso scale, goes up to what they call the atmospheric boundary layer, a couple kilometers up. That illustration came from this journal, which uh, this journal article, which I recommend. Uh, interestingly, the first of the three grand challenges that they listed was 
getting on top of the science relevant to waves, the interaction between wind farms and the atmosphere. And so with, with this, it gets tricky because one has an impact on the other. So you get this kind of yin yang thing going. And just to keep us on our toes, this is new science. And the thing that we're studying is new and about to change if build out plans go as planned in these respects. To summarize from this article published in May, I'll let you read this again. And just to drill down into to these boxed points, this was just published like a week ago by the European Commission. They didn't define notional, but it's a construction schedule. And I took the data for the construction end periods and used that as a rough proxy for commissioning. And I combined that with historical baseline data for um, existing online capacity for these countries taken from Westwood Energy's uh, Wind Logics database. I also used their estimates for these countries' um, decommissionings in order to get like a running tally of how much capacity would be in operation at any given time. And what I saw from there is that if you believe this is going to happen, then truly we've only just begun. There's a lot of seabed left to be taken up by wind farms. And these wind farms, well, if this is again the average of those in operation fully commissioned based on the data I described. These are getting bigger and bigger, just like the paper said. This raises the issue of contiguity. Zooming in here, for example, well, these, these are all up against each other, all else being equal, that's a big caveat. It means that this period, this distance of respite or recovery, you don't get it. This is from the US Northeast. Now, I would point out in fairness that the intended, the, from what I understand, the planned density of these wind farms is lower than what we have across the pond, and that could help mitigate any wake losses. And uh, again, we saw Taiwan. These are right up against each other if they were to all be built. This is something Eric's going to uh, drill down on. What happens if you have weights crossing borders? Within this area, it's a deep, from a technical prerequisite point of view, it's, it's kind of nice real estate. Just to give some context, it's pretty cozy in this area. This gives a breakout of the existing and planned capacity. And if you look to the top left there, you'll see that this is, belongs to Sweden or is within its territorial waters. This is Denmark and everything else is German. What is, what is the wind direction like? For this half of the wind roads, we're going to have Swedes waking Danes, Germans waking each other as on the way to waking the Danes, and for this other not insignificant portion of the year, the roles will reverse. Golly, I wonder if international law has any precedence that, that can offer guidance here. And in the absence of that, I wonder if maybe uh, sensible agreements could be made and Stuart will be going into that. This is another recent case. It's quite interesting. The German government had solicited for public comment on plans for this area. Both these three assets, all coming online in 2024, or to be tendered, excuse me, as well as these, this in 24 and this in 2028. And one of the published responses came from the BWO, a German industry group. And they must have looked at the wind roses because what they basically said is, 
if these come online and you plan them at those capacities, it's going to harm the yields of these. And so they said, how about this? First of all, why don't we change this to this, provided we can find another, we can make up the missing two gigawatts elsewhere. And in addition, how about changing this to this? Now, what actually happened? It's, it's kind of interesting. This was published in October. The aforementioned construction schedule was published in November. Whether coincidence or due to some other reasons, I can say happily, these were left off. So maybe, maybe they were listening. At all events, it raises this really fundamental uh, question do we want to maximize concurrent capacity that is online, regardless of what the wakes are doing to the actual generation? Or do we want to focus on achievable, economically viable generation, considering wakes? I asked this question at the beginning, and I'm pleased to know that it's starting to catch on. You can always do a little bit more and a little faster. The aforementioned EC um, data was accompanied by this report, and I'm very happy to report that the first in its list of 16 recommendations is to put this squarely at the center or within the Marine Spatial Planning dashboard, where in my opinion it belongs. I wouldn't mind them going a little, starting a little bit sooner than 2030, but you can't have everything. The German government has been funding important research in this area. Last month, the Crown Estate published on this for the first time. Fantastic move. And coming soon, courtesy of the Netherlands government, this really, really interesting study. Um, check out the website, it's, it's very cool. So where does this leave us? I think we need to widen our land. We need to stop focusing on the intra farms and start asking questions about the inter farm. And there's no excuse not to, because those wind roses I got in a heartbeat off the free global wind atlas, so use it. To go back to this point, let's not think in terms of nameplate capacity when we set our goals but what's the actual generation that we can achieve? Think ahead. Now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm always interested in talking about this with informed folks. Please reach out. And thank you for your time. And thanks to the remaining panelists. And okay, thanks very much. How do I turn this? Yeah, that's been a really good, good introduction. Thank you. I'm just struggling to. Uh, I'm glad the snafu comes at the end of the presentation. There we go. Perfect. So now we'll go to uh, Nikolai to uh, give, give us his his uh, very very uh, knowledgeable understanding of the topic. Thanks, Nikolai. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, that's coming through. Great, excellent. So I'm going to give you a bit of a technical background on uh, on wakes between offshore wind farms. I come from uh, Orsted, which is a developer, owner, and operator of uh, wind farms, both onshore and offshore, uh, and yeah, uh, renewables and energy company in general. Um, I will be focusing uh, a bit about expanding what what Ken was uh, talking about in terms of what wakes are from a technical point of view, and showing you some of the observational evidence we have of them and how we can characterize their impact. Uh, and end with some general remarks. So what you're seeing here on the right are uh, measurements of wakes flowing through one of our UK wind farms. Uh, the measurement device is uh, a set of dual Doppler radars, uh, one of which is shown on the left, uh, and you can see the turbines in the background of the photo. 
the uh, the dots uh, represent the turbine positions and the colors uh, that's the wind speed at the hop height of the turbines 100 meters and this video is the uh, frame rate is like uh, uh, every frame is one minute of real time and you can really see the wakes as these shadow uh, tails of, of lower wind speed the, the bluer colors in this video uh, that Ken was mentioning uh, before. So just to show what they what they look like uh, almost in real life. And another thing that Ken mentioned was that how what atmospheric variables the wakes depend on. They obviously depend on the on the layout, uh, not just of a wind farm, but also how wind farms are oriented to each other. I'll get back to that at the end of the presentation. But I wanted to show a couple of animations here from a, a wake model simulation showing how the wakes depend in this case on the wind direction. So as the wind direction is uh, turning uh, from north towards south and so on around the compass, uh, the wakes follow uh, always pointing behind the turbines and extending along the wind direction. Uh, and of course, then waking different turbines depending on the, uh, on the actual uh, current, uh, current direction of the wind. The other important thing that wakes depend on is the actual wind speed. Uh, and as you say, the simulations here, the colors um, on the right, they show the, the wind speed uh, deficit. So how much wind is missing in the wakes uh, due to the turbines extracting energy from the wind. And what you see here is as the wind speed is increasing, you can follow it uh, down here on the bottom left with the, with the red uh, bar. Then at higher wind speeds, the, uh, the wake, uh, wind speed deficit in the wakes start to diminish. And that's because the turbines at higher wind speeds like to uh, produce power at a constant uh, level. And to do that, they, they pitch, start pitching their blades out of the wind, letting more air pass through unimpeded, and therefore produce a smaller wind speed deficit in the wake behind them. So those are type of the, the important physics uh, of, of how wakes work, and you have to consider that. So obviously, when we are calculating the wake loss for future wind farm, we have to consider the distribution of wind direction, the wind rows that can introduced, but also the wind speed distribution, which is shown on the bottom of this plot. How often do uh, uh, all different wind directions occur, how often do all different uh, wind speeds occur. So using the uh, this dual Doppler radar that I mentioned before, we can actually take sort of a picture of what a wake between two wind farms look like. A little to the south of the wind farm that we, we looked at first, uh, 15 kilometers to the south, there's another wind farm uh, that's not owned by us, by a, by a, a competitor, another developer. Uh, and using the radar system, we could actually uh, image the wakes from there. So what you're looking at on the on the right here is a two hour average of the radar measurements where the wind direction was sort of steady. So uh, the wake was pointing in the, generally in the same direction. And we could track the uh, the wakes from that neighbor wind farms from behind the individual turbines. Uh, and then as they moved north, they sort of merged together into a, a coherent wind farm wake that that impacted the front row. And that led us to ask a question, which was, uh, can we actually see that in the power production of the front row turbines? So we came up with a way of, of visualizing that. So we're looking at the same wind farm now, but I'm zooming in on two turbines, those marked by the red dots in the simulation on the right. So the two corner turbines. And what I'm plotting on the left is the ratio of their power as I change the wind direction. And now we're looking at actual power measurements on the left. The, the right, again, is just a simulation to, to get a sense of what's going on visually. And what you can see is that at, at uh, around 150 degrees wind direction, the, uh, uh, the turbine in the lower corner is in the wake of the neighbor to the south while the other turbine is free. So taking the ratio of, of, of this one's power to that one, uh, there's a minimum in that ratio. Conversely, uh, as the wind changes uh, direction to around 165 degrees, uh, the opposite is true. Uh, A01 is, uh, is free, whereas the other one is caught in the wake of the neighbor, producing a peak in this power ratio. So looking at this ratio as a function of wind direction, you get a very characteristic signal of a minimum followed by a maximum uh, that indicates the wake influence of that neighbor wind farm on the front row uh, turbine production. I should uh, be quick and, and have this caveat on, on multiple slides because the, the impact as you see here is quite large. It's, uh, it's around 30% uh, 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 gain or loss of, of energy uh, relative uh, between these two. Uh, but it's not uh, meaning that you lose 30% of energy for the entire wind farm for the entire year. Obviously, uh, this is only for certain wind directions. I'm zooming in on a particular wind speed, and we just saw that uh, on the previous slide that uh, the wind speed uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, the wakes diminish at higher wind speeds. 
Uh, and then I'm also only showing the impact on the front row. So you can infer the, the you cannot infer the impact on the annual energy production from, from this alone. But it's a very good indicator to see what's what's going on. Um, and here we're just uh, seeing the same thing uh, in the still picture. Uh, but I want to show another example here, uh, which is slightly more complicated. In this case, the, the target wind farm is the uh, is the little one over here on in the east of the picture. And the two turbines that I'm looking at, uh, the power ratio of, is the green and the yellow one. Uh, and now there's two neighbors, so therefore we get sort of a double feature uh, of a minimum followed by a maximum, and another minimum followed by another maximum as the wind direction uh, is sweeping across this front row. Uh, the reason this particular example is interesting to me is because there was a period of time uh, where this wind farm, our target wind farm, existed all alone uh, and the neighbors uh, were not built yet. And so if I plot the same ratio of these two turbines power as a function of wind direction for that period, you get this signal without the minimum and the maximum. And it's just important for me to show you that, that this clearly indicates that these uh, features uh, are a result of the wakes from the neighbors uh, in the sense that they are not there where, before the neighbors existed. Uh, here's my, my uh, last example of, of this type of plots. Uh, in this case, the target wind farm is on the right and the two turbines that I'm interested in, again, is the green and the yellow one, and I'm plotting their power ratio uh, as a function of wind direction on the left. Uh, this is an interesting example uh, because this actually uh, is a case where the neighbor wind farm producing the wake is, uh, is this Gemini wind farm uh, to, uh, to the left, which is uh, actually in Dutch waters, whereas uh, our wind farm over here is in uh, the German exclusive economic zone. So this is a, uh, an example where we can see, I mean, it's not, uh, of course, uh, quite obvious that this would happen, uh, but wakes do transcend the national borders. Uh, there is uh, no fence stopping them, uh, suggesting that cross-national coordination is needed when we're planning wind farms uh, in, in the, for the future build out. Right, so I've showed you three examples of, of how the wake impact on, on front rows uh, of, of downstream uh, wind farms can be quantified. Uh, we've looked at, at way more than these three examples. In fact, we've identified 37 uh, pairs of offshore wind farms where we could quantify the wake impact of one on the other uh, in the same way. And the interesting thing about those is that they all at different distances. You could already kind of see that in the, in the examples I showed. Uh, but we can sample uh, anything from three kilometers separation between wind farms. Uh, and we have the, the, the wind farm examples that we have that are farthest apart are 54 kilometers uh, in separation. And what you can then see is uh, there is a bunch of scatter when we quantify the front row wake impact, but we can clearly see a trend that it's decreasing uh, as the wind farms are separated further and further. This goes back to this wake recovery that, wake, uh, that Ken was showing in his, uh, in his uh, plots from, from the model that the wind speed gradually recovers as you move further and further behind the wind farms, uh, meaning that the uh, wind farm of a particular size that is far further away has a, a smaller impact than a wind farm of the same size that is closer to your target wind farm. And in fact, that's, that's my next example here. Now we're in a hypothetical example where um, uh, it's just simulations, but I wanted to include these to actually account for the full a year uh, impact on the production given this wind rose. So the predominant wind direction for this site is from the Southwest. And in my first example, the target wind farm, which is the full circles is separated by five kilometers from a neighbor that is larger, but importantly is uh, located upstream in the predominant wind direction. So much of the year, this will be waking our target wind farm and the wake loss is about 8%. Moving that neighbor further away, in line with what we just saw in the observations on the previous slide, the wake impact is reduced. So when it's 15 kilometers away, uh, the, uh, the wake uh, impact is, uh, or the loss from this neighbor is more than half to just under 4%. And then the impact of the wind rose uh, can be illustrated in the last example where the neighbors moved to the other side of our target wind farm, such that it is in a direction that is less frequently occurring according to the wind rose. Again, the separation is five kilometers, but compared to the first example where the uh, neighbor wind farm was on the other side, uh, we only have about half as high a wake loss. So the wind speed distribution at the site uh, is very important uh, because wakes depend on wind speed, but the wind direction distribution at the site and where the neighbor is located is also very, very important, uh, along with the distance of the neighbor and 
what uh, what the neighbor looks like, what's the layout. Final example I have is from a real world calculation, a recent German auction. Uh, in this case, the target wind farm is the blue one. The neighbor, uh, future neighbors are, uh, are all the red areas here. And relative to a case where this uh, target wind farm was existing alone, a hypothetical case, because that's never gonna happen, uh, the neighbors cause a loss of production of 17%. Uh, so quite significant as we've uh, already seen. So I wanna end with just some uh, conclusions here. Um, as a developer, it's important, important for us to, to, to state that uh, we want more wind farms. Uh, regardless of the wake effect, because more wind farms means more green electrons, and that's going to uh, ultimately contribute. Every new wind farm we we we, we add uh, to the build that will contribute to the uh, the transition to uh, to a sustainable energy system. That said, the wakes cannot be avoided. Uh, so the best you can do in terms of planning a future wind farm uh, in your business case is to use an unbiased wake model, one that you validated against uh, data. And then, of course, take all relevant neighbor wind farms into account in your simulations. Uh, what's relevant, uh, it, it depends on, on distance, but also the likelihood that these neighbors uh, will actually get built. What's planned and what's just sort of an idea that might happen. And then if you're a government, uh, you need to, of course, understand that wakes do not respect national borders, as we've already seen a couple of times. And then the important thing uh, from a development perspective is to mitigate the risk that future neighbors might represent for developers. That means having a clear pipeline for the future build out. Where is a neighbor wind farms gonna come? What sizes are they gonna have? What is the timing going to be? Uh, and then it really there's there's some there's, there's a in terms of, of risk, you could turn you could potentially turn this into an opportunity if you uh, coordinate with each other and collaborate, not just on a cross-country level, but also uh, governments with developers in terms of figuring out where should future uh, wind farms be. And then uh, I can only encourage that there's some discussion of a framework for, for sharing the resources in general. And I think that's what the rest of the panel is gonna uh, address. Thank you. It's great. Thank you very much, Nikolai. That's really fascinating. Um, I, I see there's already a couple of questions coming in through the Q&A function. That's great. Keep those coming and welcome to those um, at the end. So, so now we'll move, uh, I guess, a little bit away from the te technical, more into the um, maybe regulatory and legal side of things. So, um, Eric, I'll hand over to, to you. Thank you very much, Tom. So, hang on. I'm just going to see if I can share my screen. There we are. So, you can all see my screen? Yes, thanks. Wonderful. Right. So uh, thank you so much for having me, I guess. If most of you are in the UK right now, I should say hello from across the pond in, in freezing in freezing Norway. I'm very honoured uh, to be here today amongst uh, these other heavy hitters, you might say, because I am only a, a PhD candidate. So I'm, I'm humbled uh, to be invited today. Uh, like I said, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Bergen, and my research focus is on uh, different North Sea licensing procedures for offshore wind. And as part of my PhD, I, I uh, stumbled, stumbled upon this issue of uh, transnational or transboundary wake effects, uh, and I decided to to write a paper with other colleagues uh, from Bergen Offshore Wind Center, an interdisciplinary paper on, on, on precisely wake effects and international law in particular. Um, so the presentation that I'll be taking you through today is entitled Gone with the Wind, uh, Wind Farm Induced Wakes and Regulatory Gaps. And this uh, is a paper that I, I wrote together with Ignacio Etienne Christian, and Joachim, and it's interdisciplinary in, in nature, where, uh, whereby the, the first half of the paper really focuses on the physical aspects of wake effects uh, with a case study of Sola Norshatu, which is a planned offshore wind farm, uh, which will have very likely um, transboundary wake effects going into the, the Danish um, exclusive economic zone, where they have planned uh, to develop offshore wind as well. So I'm going to start with addressing this one particular question. And uh, I noted, Nikolai, that you, you mentioned uh, that wakes do not respect national borders. 
uh, but then perhaps states should. I think that's a, a good question to start addressing, perhaps. So wake effects can certainly have indirect economic and environmental implications. Uh, and these implications arise from the electricity not produced, essentially, on account of, of having been impacted by, by wake effects, because with the electricity that you don't produce, that might have uh, negative effects on on consumers in, in terms of electricity and energy prices. And that's certainly not something that we want. And uh, if we zoom out, uh, it can also impede with the energy transition at large, actually, and even delay it. Because the renewable electricity that we don't produce uh, will logically have to be supplanted or or complemented by alternative, perhaps more conventional energy sources, such as fossil fuels. And that's certainly not something that we want either. And then as we move into this area, uh, sorry, this era of, of blue growth, uh, we can even see wind resources as having economic value. Um, as part of the decarbonization process necessary to mitigate climate change, uh, offshore wind will likely play a very significant role, really, in decarbonizing existing global energy sectors. And uh, therefore, we should perhaps see wind resources as having an economic value. And where a downstream wind farm is, for some other reason, uh, for some reason, um, deprived of, of the relative resource, perhaps that gives a, a claim for compensation. And uh, so we might see legal conflict arise uh, in consideration of, um, uh, of transboundary wake effects. Uh, another reason is that wake effects can cause a so-called race to the water phenomenon in which states rush development uh, in order to reap benefits from best yet available wind resources. Um, so a race of the water phenomenon may lead to a, a uh, may lead to neglected principles of environmental protection and and uh, also spatial management, which may also leave states in breach of regional agreements such as the uh, OSPAR agreement. The next question that we naturally have to address then is whether wake effects are governed under international law. Uh, we focus specifically on international law in our article and not necessarily national law. Um, so the legal instrument that we based our analysis on was the United Nations Law of the Sea Conventions from, from, from 1982, uh, which is otherwise known as UNCLOS. And what UNCLOS does is that it provides rights and obligations on a resource specific basis. That pretty much means that under international law, there are specific rights and obligations uh, which are determined on, on whether you are talking about one type of energy resource or another. For example, there are different rights and obligations with respect to non-living resources and living resources, which are governed under the uh, under UNCLOS. So, for example, uh, with respect to non-living resources, uh, there have states, coastal states, have struck bilateral and multilateral agreements with respect to petroleum deposits, which straddle existing boundaries. Um, and those agreements, they, they aim towards finding an equitable solution uh, with what is known as unitization of petroleum deposits. Uh, and with regards to fisheries, uh, you have something called RFMO, uh, R RFMOs, I think it's called, uh, Regional Management Fisheries Organizations. And they may regulate uh, the exploitation or, uh, well, fisheries, essentially. So total allowable catches and quotas and so forth. And elsewhere under international law and customary international law in, in particular, there are also uh, specific rights and obligations uh, which apply to shared resources. Uh, so that would be international watercourses in, in particular. 
So uh, coastal states have sovereign rights uh, to, to exploit their natural resources within the exclusive economic zone. That would be the area which, which is between 12 nautical miles outside the baseline and up to 200 nautical miles off, off the coast. And what Article 56.1a in, in plus essentially says is that coastal states have the sovereign right to explore and exploit energy from the water, currents, and winds. And mind you, this is a convention that entered into force in 1982. And at the time, it was probably difficult for the drafters of the convention to foresee that the oceans would act as a hub for renewable energy development, especially from offshore wind farms, large scale, commercial scale offshore wind farms. <laughs> Um, so you might say that the drafters of the convention were very much future oriented. And that is probably why they managed to squeeze in these three final words in, in Article 56, uh, 56.1, uh, which mentions water currents and, and winds. Next, what then are the limitations to offshore wind exploitation, which is liable to cause wake effects? And besides the reference uh, that I just mentioned to, to winds, there is no explicit mentioning of, of uh, exploiting wind resources under, under the, the UNCLOS. But there is no express regulation. There are, on the other hand, implied regulation. And this flows from Article 56.2. And it essentially says that the coastal state shall have due regard to the rights and duties of other states and shall act in a manner compatible with the provisions of this convention. And what this translates into is this notion of a good neighborliness principle. We, we all have to be good neighbors towards one another. And based on a case uh, from 2015, the Chagos arbitration, this very likely means that coastal states must consult other states in circumstances where offshore wind farms are liable to cause uh, transboundary wake effects. And the Chagos arbitration case, well, it did not specifically address wake effects naturally, uh, but it provided this test in interpreting the due regard concept which essentially says that the extent of due regard must be quantified against the nature of the rights held by other states, uh, the importance, the extent of the anticipated impairment, the nature and importance of the activities contemplated by the coastal state, and so forth. Um, and where offshore wind uh, is a big policy ambition um, on part of lots of different coastal states, naturally, we have to assume uh, that at least we have to consult other states. So uh, that, that is the, a conclusion that I've drawn from the Chagos arbitration uh, case. So then, is this scarce regulation sufficient? Is it enough that we have to consult and talk to one another if we discover that our offshore wind farms are liable to cause transboundary wake effects? Uh, so there is widespread political will across different North Sea coast states to both develop offshore wind and to foster cooperation. Uh, we do, for instance, have that's, the Austin Declaration. Cool, thank you. Sorry. Uh, we have the Declaration from 2023 and the GRID initiative. Uh, so we should definitely work towards finding solutions to, the, to this issue and, and come up with framework agreements uh, which are made on a bilateral and multilateral basis. And that pretty much concludes my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Right, no need for me to cut you off, <laughs> off there. No, there. sorry, that's right. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> so, thanks very much for that. Perfect. That's uh, really fascinating. Um, we'll move on now to uh, KK to Vivi, who's going to be uh, talking a bit more about the legal side with the focus on the US. So thanks, KK. You're just on mute there. Can you see my screen? Yes, there we go. Can see your screen. Okay. I can see you. Thanks. Great. And I hope people, you know, will be focusing on the slideshow and not on the, the view behind me for but anyone who's curious, this um thing behind me is a 
wake simulation from the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado. So what they're trying to do is visualize what a wake would look like. Um, so I'm trying to advance my slides. My slides aren't advancing, sorry. There, okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna cover three things. I'll give you a little bit of background on offshore and onshore wind in the United States. Then most of my presentation will focus on lessons from US wind development on private lands. I've been writing about uh, wind legal issues for almost 20 years. And um, so, and I've interviewed a few dozen developers and people in the industry. So I have some perspectives on that and the legal implications. And then I'll last sum up with US strategies. <clears throat> so as you all may know, the United States is maybe ahead of the curve on, you know, some of the land-based capacity because we have a lot of land, so terrestrial wind. Um, we, we have 144, over 144,000 megawatts installed on land at the end of 2020. And on this map, you can see some of the places where we have that. Now, with respect to those of you in the EU and the UK, we're behind because even though we have 52,000 megawatt potential generating capacity, and I'm showing the different states where we've got some uh, leases and interest in the ones where we're focusing on most, some of those up in the Northeast. In reality, we have very little actually installed offshore. Block Island was the first one in 2016 with just 30 megawatts, and that was not in federal waters, that was in state waters in Rhode Island. And then Martha's Vineyard, Vineyard Wind, will be the first commercial wind farm in the United States. And their first turbine actually finally came into operation. It's a 13 megawatt turbine in October of this year. So the final project there will have 62 turbines, but we have a goal of 30,000 megawatts by 2030. And so we've got a long way to go and a lot of legal blocks. So what are some of the lessons that we learned? As Tom and Ken said, they were from the oil and gas industry. And some of you may be familiar with the waste that occurred in the United States with oil and gas development, where the rule of capture uh, and competitive leasing created a lot of waste. We have all these additional derricks that we don't need and actually um, prevented full recovery of the resource. And so governments intervened with force spacing and pooling and unitization. And here are a couple of my most recent articles on um, wind waste in that context. And, and I took this photograph in California. So we saw that in California, people weren't aware of wakes and they put turbines right next to each other. And it looks very similar, I think, to the oil and gas situation. Um, so um, I did an interdisciplinary article. One of my articles is interdisciplinary. We looked at wind waste and we looked at some farms in Texas. So we had a downwind farm that existed before an upwind farm was built. And then we had a control farm. Now these wind companies didn't really cooperate with us. My experience in interviewing people is that they didn't wanna talk about it. And when they did go to court, they would try to close the records on it. And so there's not a lot of um, court cases that you can find, but through this uh, public data, we could model that there were significant private costs with three um, fewer megawatts and the losses in power sales. And then also there were some social costs of carbon that were 4.3 million at a social cost of carbon of $39 a ton, which right now the US EPA is recommending $190 a ton. So significant uh, losses with respect to social costs of carbon as well. Um, so I looked at some of the things like, well, how do you deal with this? Uh, is a litigation a good answer? And I would argue, no, you have to hire a lawyer and it's expensive. You have an uncertain outcome. The plaintiff, the party that's bringing it, has the burden of proof, so that makes it hard for them to prove. What kind of uh, basis would you have? Well, there are two types of damage. There's close turbulence, three to 10 rotor diameters, and you might have some liability for actually destroying equipment. But with respect to mostly what we're focusing on here, which is longer, longer distance lost power, 
Um, it would be difficult to sue for taking or theft because at least in the United States, in most instances, you don't have a property interest in the wind. And I think probably in the UK and the EU, you have even less because there, it's not considered a private right. It's considered something that the government uh, leases. So it's a common property right. And um, another approach might be common law nuisance, but there's a problem with that because you have to show unreasonable or unlawful use that substantially interferes with your property. And it doesn't seem unreasonable or unlawful if the other party is working under a legitimate lease. There is one uh, possibility is modified nuisance. So what is that? California created that um, with their solar they said if you plant a tree or shrub after a solar panel has been installed, then if greater than 10% of the solar collector is shaded between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., that is private nuisance. So it, it defines nuisance. So you could, you could do that with wind. You could have federal or state legislation that defined undue interference or nuisance within a set space or time period. And then wakes other than that, the party just has to live with. So that's one thing, a modified nuisance standard. Another thing that we have in the United States and some states with respect to water is prior appropriation. So it means uh, basically, you know, protecting the status quo first in time, first in right. That has been recognized in water law, but not in wind law. So if that were the case with the example from the Nature Energy article that I mentioned earlier, then the Roscoe Farm which was built first could have required the Lorraine farm to either not build up wind of them or could have uh, required some compensation from them and it would have been legally protected. Now, in the absence of um, these legal protections such as prior appropriation or modified nuisance, we've seen predatory behaviors in the United States and most of the people I talked to did not wanna be identified at all and they didn't even want to be generically identified um, because they were telling me things like, OK, well, you know, sometimes somebody would come up to the uh, developer of a farm that already existed and said, what's it worth to you for us not to build upwind of you? So there were some things like that. And also there's a tendency with a little less, uh, you know, Wild West behavior like that, but to maximize the resource within your own lease and not to work with another farm to maximize the entire resource. There's also a tension between developers of the farm who want to maximize their production and projection so they can get better funding, but the financers have third-party reviewers and their tendency is to be more conservative with their estimates because they don't want to be uh, liable to banks for underperformance. It's a defensive strategy, so they create buffer zones. Um, so we, we look a little bit, if you use buffer zones, everything in blue here means that you're taking valuable acreage out of production. So I don't think that's the best answer. And Nikolai's uh, modeling showed that just being farther apart wasn't the only solution. Actually, it's smarter to just have better planning and, and placement of the resource. So what is the U.S. trying to do right now with this? Um, our Department of Energy and the National Renewable Renewable Energy Lab are doing a comprehensive wake study. So as some of you mentioned, just getting data. <clears throat> We're trying to lay out the leases so they're oriented to minimize lease to lease wake. So you do it with the prevailing wind. Um, and then there's some disclosure at lease sales. The, we are um, issuing BOEM, um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is releasing some renewable energy modernization rules. And in those rules, they require wake disclosure in the construction operation plans. And they may also uh, have some language about prevention of waste because that's in the oil and gas rules. Um, sometimes, occasionally, they've had clauses in leases that encourage lessees to work with each other. And if there's not, there's sort of a penalty of mandating a setback of a certain amount. And um, there are some cooperation with shared resources to bring electricity to shore through transmission. So possibly that could be used to um, help with the layouts. And finally, um, as Eric mentioned, I've been advocating for unitization similar to oil and gas for a while. 
which means working together, but so far that hasn't been discussed very much in the United States. So these are a couple of my books that I've written, and then there's a link to my SSRN for other articles if you wanted to look at those. And I just want to conclude with, um, I guess, reinforcing what I think Ken, Ken and uh, Nikolai both said is that the answer is coordination and collaboration. So we are focusing not on just the maximizing what you can get out of a particular lease or farm, but looking at the whole picture interfarm. Thank you. Thanks very much, KK. That's great and interesting talking about that coordination and collaboration. It's a, a real focus, not just for this, but for the uh, wind industry more, more generally. I know that uh, Tim Pick, who's going to be up next, was speaking about a lot of this in, in the report that he uh, provides to government. Um, I think for the UK, wind wakes is maybe a good problem to have because it means we have lots of offshore wind in the water. But uh, Tim, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Can you hear me okay? Yes, coming through. And, and can you see me? Because I can't see we can, myself. We can see, we can see, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, look, as you said, um, and I'm not, I'm going to try and avoid the legal stuff because Eric and uh, KK have done a really great job of that. And in fact, um, Eric, um, you should be less modest about what you're doing there because that was exactly following the train of thought. And I'll just um, I'll just go through my own thoughts on this. So, um, as Tom said, we spent the last year or so with the UK's offshore wind acceleration task force. This is pretty UK specific for now. Um, and one of the topics we looked at in some detail there was marine spatial planning and where that might go in a UK context. And I have to say, a lot of that discussion was about um, managing different uses of the sea. So you know, conflicts between obviously fishing and offshore wind, but also things like carbon sequestration and offshore wind or oil and gas and offshore wind. Um, but during the course of those conversations, someone did raise, well, hang on, there's an increasing risk of what I've sort of um, colloquially called the friendly fire or blue on blue type objections between wind farms as we start to get more crowded in the in the UK waters. Um, and, and so it does raise an interesting question about how we deal with that and obviously in, in the first instance I think that's the matter for the Crown Estate and I think Ken you and I were discussing recently that you know there is work going on in this space for the UK domestic um, position but then as you wind it forward and as Eric has rightly said um, you start to think about how do you deal with this on a cross-border basis in a in somewhere like the North Sea where all the coastal states are aggressively ramping their offshore wind targets um, and aggressively deploy, you know, deploying offshore wind, frankly, as quickly as they possibly can. Um, and the place is becoming quite crowded and you only have to fly over from the UK to Europe um, these days and you see how crowded it's getting with the number of turbines below you on a clear day. So um, I think there is a need for um, some thinking around how a cooperation in a basin like, and we, you know, it's interesting there was an announcement last week about Greater North Sea Basin Initiative. Basin is obviously uh, historically often used as an oil and gas expression, but um, I guess it makes sense to use it from for offshore wind as well. Um, and where would you go with some kind of cooperation arrangement for a crowded sea space like the North Sea? Um, my my head was in a similar place to Eric. I sort of originally started thinking about precedents from my own history in oil and gas um, and the sort of joint development zones you get. And you see those in the Middle East, in Africa, Asia, where where states cooperate on the um, extraction of a cross-border petroleum resource, um, effectively by unitizing it and appointing an operator. Um, not so easy to do with wind, I think, and we're also talking about an enormous area, not such a defined, a defined physical resource. Um, the other, the other sort of, um, the other precedent that I, I know well, it, which is similar but again not quite relevant to offshore wind, was some of the, um, the, the sort of treaty of the Nile type arrangement, where the, the, um, I guess the, the. Um, on the term for it, 
the, the states along the Nile have historically had various agreements about how they would and would not use the water as it flowed through their country um, in order to preserve the interests of the further downstream states. And that's particularly important on the Nile for things like hydroelectric power, um, ensuring that the flow of water and the energy content is uh, is maintained for the for, for the um, downstream states, and obviously Egypt being at the mouth of the Nile has had a particular interest in that. But again, a more predictable resource doesn't really vary very much. Um, you don't need a windrose to tell you which direction the Nile is flowing in. And then I think it takes you into a completely different world of: Do you take a basin like the North Sea? and talk about unitization? Do you talk about quotas like in the fishing space? Um, or do you just go for a very simple solution around buffer zones along um, international boundaries and start to agree that you won't push up quite so close to the boundary? I don't have the answer to that. I think it's a, um, I think it's something that needs to be on the agenda. I was really pleased to see Ken slide with, I hadn't seen that report that was issued by the Northern Seas um, Council, which has started to look at wind wakes, because um, I think that's where this needs to go, and probably rather quickly for the North Sea, because that seems to be where this will come up um, as a substantive issue between governments, probably first in the world. And I think that's that's probably um, what I wanted to say, Tom. I think it's probably best we listen to Stuart, who's got an interesting story about a specific situation and then we can go into the conversation part of this great yeah that sounds good thanks very much tim um stuart we'll hand over to you yeah thanks very much for the introduction tom uh it's, um, i feel privileged to be involved today in, in in the discussion and it's um i think you can all share, uh, see my screen there Yes, that's working. Thanks. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stuart Gordon. I'm a solicitor at Adelshaw Goddard. Um, I've been working in the renewable sector for the last five years. Um, and I've been involved in various types of renewable energy technology, including wind, and worked on both the project side, but also in corporate M&A transactions within the energy sector. So I'm not going to go into uh, what wake effect and weight loss are, because we've heard so much about that today. What I'm going to do is give you a high-level overview of a, a UK uh, weight loss agreement. Um, and But before I do that, what, what exactly is a weight loss agreement? Well, it's a commercial agreement between neighbouring developers to compensate for any losses suffered due to the wake effect caused by a new wind farm. So the typical scenario is where a new offshore wind farm is given consent to be developed, which, depending on the various factors that we've heard uh, from the panellists today, could have an impact on the wind resource available for any um, existing offshore wind farms. So as a backdrop, the issue for um, an existing wind farm is that it will have been modelled and obtained project finance based on certain projections and estimated revenues. So it's therefore key that the data and modelling for any new wind farm is correctly configured so that the impact on the existing wind farm can be predicted accurately. However, um, as the panel have touched on today, before we even get to draft a weight loss agreement, both the existing developer and the new developer must acknowledge that with a new wind farm being built, that it will cause existing uh, wind farms to energy production to reduce. And this all also links to the point that uh, Eric made about how we get cross-border cooperation and collaboration between uh, different countries on this matter. Um, and then the parties have to define what the likely weight loss, uh, weight loss reduction is, um, which I'm going to touch on shortly. So now on to the key terms and conditions. Um, I should say that these are terms that the parties may want to consider, but every agreement is different. So depending on various factors, these terms will vary between different weight loss agreements. So the first one is uh, data collection and monitoring um, and confidentiality. Um, typically, baseline data will be used, gathered from the existing wind farm turbines for an agreed period of time, which will demonstrate the level of generation by the existing wind farm before the new one's built. Uh, data collection methods may be specified in the agreement as well. And, and examples, as many of you will know, are sort of meteor meteorological data or SCADA. Um, the new developer 
will also want its own monitoring system deployed so it can verify the existing wind developers data. Um, and really at the heart of this agreement is data sharing and the handling of confidential information. Um, the parties may also want to include an inadequacy of damages clause for any confidentiality breaches, which provides the parties other remedies in addition to claiming for damages under the contract. So now onto the most important one, the payment mechanism. So the payment and a weight loss agreement is for any losses suffered by the existing developer from weight loss caused by the new wind farm. And it's typically under two headings. One, reduced energy production from the wake effect. And two, increased o &M costs from turbulence, which KK touched on earlier. So normally at, at the effective date of a weight loss agreement and based on the modelling that's been done, there's an estimated annual reduction in energy production caused by the new wind farm. Each year, there'll be an estimated annual reduction payment paid up front to the, uh, by the new developer to the existing developer. And this figure is normally adjusted uh, by indexation on an annual basis. So the new wind farm developer will then share the actual wind data with the existing wind farm developer by providing its wind farm availability percentage. And this is normally done on, on an open book basis. This figure is based on the modeling and assumes that the new wind farm operates at 100% availability. The energy production by the existing wind farm is then deemed to be reduced by an agreed percentage per year, which is the maximum impact that a new wind farm can have on the existing wind farm. So then to calculate the actual payment, the agreed maximum generation reduction percentage is multiplied by the new wind farm's actual availability. So really the key point here is that the estimated figure is then changed to an actual figure based on the availability data. Then once the actual data is available, the actual amount of compensation payable must be calculated and paid by way of a reconciliation within an agreed timescale. So if the actual figure is greater than the estimated figure, the new wind farm developer would have to pay extra compensation. However, if the actual figure is less than the estimated figure, the new wind farm developer can claw some money back from the existing developer. And we quite often see that there will be an indemnity um, in favour of the existing developer for any losses covered by the new wind farm, which is relevant if there is a grid sharing arrangement in place, grid connection sharing arrangement in place. Uh, also, we, the key to these agreements are dispute resolution and expert appointment clauses. This is because there are likely to be disagreements between the two parties in respects of the data being shared and the resulting compensation figures. So we would typically see an expert being appointed under the agreement to produce certain reports and do calculations on the wake effect and turbulence. And the expert clause will normally allow parties to nominate an independent expert or nominate an alternative if the first choice is not available. And then looking at the design and configuration of the wind farm, usually the existing developer will want to understand the configuration of the new wind farm so as to predict the impact of the wind on the wind resource and, and projected weight loss. So, if, the, so the, if there's a requirement to reconfigure the offshore wind farms turbines to reduce the wake effect, then the consents and leasing arrangements should be carefully considered. It will be interesting to see as we move more from fixed to floating wind turbines, if it will be easier to reconfigure a new offshore wind farm turbine to reduce the effect of weight loss. So lastly, I just wanted to touch on a couple of uh, other points. Change of control. Um, this is where there's uh, where the new wind farm changes ownership. And due to the uh, existing developer potentially receiving significant amounts of compensation, it will want to know the identity and financial covenant of a new owner. There might be an obligation to notify the existing developer on a change of control or even have a consent requirement. But again, that will depend on the projected impact of the wake effect as well as the amounts being paid. Um, and lastly, just wanted to touch on funders and financial covenant. Um, as many of you know, quite often we see that, that wind farms will have project finance in the background, so funders will be very interested in this. Um, and also an existing developer might want to check out the financial covenant of the new wind farm funder as well. And there might be things like uh, parent company guarantees or credit support, uh, depending on the new developer's financial covenant. So that was all I was going to say about this topic, but can I just thank Ken and Ori Catapult for having me on the webinar to contribute to the discussion. Thank you.
Thanks very much. <clears throat> I think if uh, the panelists maybe want to put your cameras back on so we can see all your smiling faces again, that'll be nice. Um, thanks, everyone. That's, I think it's been a really comprehensive uh, uh, coverage of both the technical and the legal and regulatory sides of things. I think maybe we've got another uh, 15, 20 minutes, roughly. If we have a maybe a, a short discussion about some of the topics, uh, one thing that's jumping to mind is we seem to have a bit of a vacuum of regulation and treaties here um, covering this, both in some national jurisdictions and, and globally. So just, uh, I'm not sure who I'm asking this question to, but will deployment potentially be held back either by uh, out of fear of being drowned in legislation and, and, and lawsuits or from actual um, uh, lawsuits taking taking effect? I'm not sure if anyone wants to volunteer to cover that. Uh, KK. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, as I said, in the United States, um, the industry has been, there have been lawsuits, but they aren't very open about them. But on land, there were lawsuits. And I think the uncertainty is maybe preventing people from doing developments where they should. As as I mentioned, I, I sort of think uh, Tim made a good point that, um, you know, he, he mentioned that we might have buffer zones and I worry about too big a buffer zone because then you, you are taking uh, areas out of development. Um, and I like Stewart's thing of maybe um, having some kind of agreement required. But as Tim mentioned, there are other uh, concerns here too, because if you have uh, ocean platforms for the wind turbines that aren't being needed and they're impacting other interests like fishing, then you want to watch out for that as well. So, so again, just I, I'm going to keep advocating for cooperation, and I love Stuart's idea of some kinds of agreements maybe being required. Um, not sure who had their hand up first, but I'll go to Tim. Tim first, maybe. Yeah, I think we're a way off this issue. Certainly, in the offshore space slowing down or development. I mean, there is still plenty of space in the scene. I guess the other, the other part about offshore as opposed to onshore is that the gov the state itself controls the sort of um, allocation of seabed more than perhaps on land in the US or certainly in the UK where you've got private ownership and land gets traded all the time. So I think there's there are more levers that the state in a broad in its broadest sense, including the likes of the Grand Estate, can pull to manage this up front. Um, and I guess on the on the international side we we've got to look at areas where sea is getting crowded uh, for, for me that's where the north sea opportunity of baltic sea could be the first areas that hit this hard and um and perhaps we end up setting some kind of precedent that gets used elsewhere okay thanks Tim. Um, i guess just the last point we do we do have these we do have these cooperative vehicles for governments to at least speak to each other about these issues certainly for the north sea so um you would hope they would get on the agenda fairly soon. Sure, thanks. Um, Eric, do you want to come in? Thank you so much. Um, so from what I do know, I, I'm not from the industry, but I do know that developers tend to be risk averse, right? They, they rely on certain economic projections in order to uh, in order to make investment decisions which are feasible and, and viable. And I suppose that anything uh, which is likely to compromise that certainty will put them off, essentially. And that's certainly not something that we want. Um, so wake effects are very likely to, perhaps the word is destabilize uh, uh, the status quo in which um, offshore wind developers rely on a certain capacity in order to, to deem projects to be financially uh, or, or economically viable. Um, however, I do think that there are the there are good reasons to be optimistic about this stuff as well. I just I I don't only want to play devil's advocate in this panel. I wanna um but I yeah like I said I do think that there are reasons to be very optimistic when it comes to transboundary uh, wake effects as well because there are very promising technologies which allows us to be more flexible in terms of marine spatial planning. And those types of uh, technologies are floating wind turbines. 
Um, with floating wind, uh, we're not necessarily fixed uh, to shallow seabed areas, and it allows us to, to plan more flexibly uh, with the view of mitigating uh, wake effects. So with these new technologies, I think that there are reasonable ways in which we actually can mitigate this as, as an issue at large. Yeah, thanks very much. That's a that's a really interesting point. And maybe if I expand on that and go to Nikolai and ask one, yes, uh, floating turbines obviously expands the amount of seabed we have. But is there anything else uh, that might, from a technology point of view, uh, I know Julio has asked in the Q and A about larger turbines. Is that potentially going to mitigate against this? Yeah. So uh, as far as floating goes, I'm, I'm, I'm I think that it's mainly the the ability to unlock. Uh, areas of seabed further away from the coast and, and potentially further away from, from neighbor wind farms. As far as larger turbines go, um, the answer is, uh, will they reduce wake effects? Yes and no. Um, it is true that if you, for the same installed capacity, of course, you need fewer units um, if you have uh, larger turbines. So uh, the amount of wake effect in that sense will be reduced. But uh, if you have larger turbines, you also have larger rotors, so the wakes they produce will be broader, and they will last longer. The, the critical length scale uh, that determines the physics of the wakes is the rotor diameter. So in kilometers, the wake behind uh, uh, a larger rotor will just uh, last for, for longer than from a, a smaller turbine. So it's not a, a given, and it's, and it's again, <laughs> unfortunately, the, the details are of a particular site is the deciding factor. Thanks very much. If no one else wants to come in on that point, um, maybe I've got one for Stuart. So uh, Tim and, and uh, others have talked about the different precedents. When you're trying to understand this, you might look at the oil and gas sector, fishing, uh, the, the Nile Treaty. Was there any Kind of framework that you based your uh, contracting on, or was that something brand new that you had to invent effectively? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right there, Tom. It was. It was sort of a, a very bespoke agreement, but it was to do with it was to do with the land rights. That 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 was that was the one that I negotiated. Um, so, so so that was that was driving that. But obviously, you've got um, you know other weight loss agreements may come out may come about for other reasons. You know, for example, KK touched on, you know, they almost the threatened, uh, you know, uh, threatening somebody, um, another developer to, to go upstream. Again, that that could bring about a weight loss agreement. So, yeah, I think it just really depends. It depends on the depends on the circumstances, depends on the commercial uh, sort of, you know, the, the sort of commercials of the, uh, between the parties. I would say that's that's the key. Does anyone else want to come in on this on this topic? I have a question on another topic, if I may. Um, this is for Nikolai. If we're going to have, whether it's through legislation or contracts, treaties or whatever, some means of governing perhaps compensation for wake losses, Offshore, um, how feasible, reliable, and economical would it be to have kit which can do the monitoring of the baselines and what the wind is doing? I mean, it would be as simple as just putting plunking a few floating LIDAR buoys out there, or do we need overflights, satellite data, that, that, um, that James Bond-looking piece of equipment that you showed? Um, how could that possibly work? Well, I mean that there's there's a lot to be learned already by looking from the the, uh, the operational data from the turbines themselves, as I was showing. Uh, it is though difficult to to extract sort of a full wake loss on a, a wind farm from that. Um, however, I think actually uh, I would be much more uh, pragmatic and just say if, if we have reliable models and given that the science on the modeling is uh, is still evolving, but we're getting smarter every day by, by having more wind farms to, uh, to, to look at data from. If, if the models are reliable, um, I don't see why, it would just be simpler to rely on, on, on models for, 
for assessing this. Um, and it goes both ways, right? I mean, if you have two wind farms, one would be waking uh, the other one in certain wind directions, and for the opposite directions, the the opposite would be true. So, uh, you know, if you can if you can agree on a, on on the accuracy of the model, then you can possibly also, I can imagine, agree on on what the effect you have on each other is. And so, would it be? I'm sorry. And so, would it be fair to say then, between the availability of SCADA data? and willingness to, to go with models. We're not looking at new expenditure on monitoring equipment as a major thing to work out when you're looking at project economics. Uh, that, that, would, that would be detrimental economically, but also uh, practically make it more difficult to do these things. So uh, I, I would uh, hope that we could avoid that. Thanks. Um, there's just a question from John Best, which kind of follows on nicely from this asking, um, how do we know if we're measuring this that it's a wake effect and not just a, a developer or asset owner that's not doing their O and M, not maintaining their gearboxes, for example, and we're seeing a yield drop there? Is there a way of differentiating and saying this is definitely a wake effect versus another impact? Was that for me? Um, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I'm hurting myself for you. Yeah. No, no. I, mean, I saw. The, I showed this example of of a of a case of a of a wind farm that that was operating on its own, and then it got a, a, a upstream neighbors uh, later on, and you could see the change uh, in 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 what the data showed a clear change. Uh, but in, in terms of of a day to day uh, situation, then uh, then you would have to to have a closer look at the data to understand these things. Uh, obviously, if 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 your O and M. Uh, strategy has issues with uh, turbines standing still and so I mean that, that they do all the time because they have to be maintained um, then then that would clearly show in the data right that that's the that's the case uh, and it's important to understand that not just why as an example of why the target wind farm is producing less but also in terms of of the, the wake effect from the upstream neighbor may be overestimated by a model that doesn't know if those turbines were unavailable or curtailed Thanks. So I don't, um, yeah. There's a question. Yeah. No, that's all right. Thanks. Uh, there's a question from Catherine here asking. Uh, this is open to the whole panel. Uh, what is the role of policymakers and and regulators in this space? And uh, KK, put your hand up for this one. Um, yeah. Um, as Tim mentioned, I think you know there are some things maybe that you could learn from the United States on land, but. There are things I think we can learn from you offshore because he's right on land in the United States. We have private landowners who are all fighting for the most for their own royalties. They don't care about the neighbor. Um, but when you have a shared resource with a government uh, controlling it, then then you can set some guidelines. And I think, um, you know, the, the question is not being is that those guidelines be aligned with the science as, as Nikolai has, right? Not just maybe having across the board some kind of large setback, but being aware of some of the issues and, and helping encourage people to work together within the science. Uh, Tim, you'd like to come in? Yeah, look, I, it, uh, KK kind of covered the point, but I think it, it, there's clearly an important role for whichever body is leasing out the seabed um, in terms of planning that appropriately, taking this issue into account, but also giving people a bit of forward guidance on. So we saw the example in Ken's slides about the, um, I think it was the areas in Germany where people are already saying, well, you shouldn't do that at this time because it's going to have a knock-on impact. So um, it, it, it goes back to this issue just comes up time again about robust data-driven marine spatial planning and getting that right. Um, but I think absolutely there's a, to me, it starts with the, the leasing. I guess you could deal with some of this through the planning process, but by then someone's already paid for a lease and do you really want then objections between wind farms, which I, which I imagine is where that agreement um, that Stuart it perhaps came from objections either between landowners or or in a planning process. Ideally, certainly in the offshore world, certainly in the UK, you would ideally not have a situation where two different Crown Estate lessees were objecting to each other because it should be worked out up front. 
Eric, did you want to come in on this one? Yes, please. Um, it's not on this point in particular, but it's just something, uh, well, well, it's a, it has to do with Stuart's presentation. And I thought it was very interesting uh, to see that developers have already entered into agreements on another, uh, on a bilateral basis when, with one another in order to will find ways uh, to compensate each other for, for weight losses. I, I had no idea that this even existed, so that's very exciting. But I do ask myself the question, though, and I pose the same question to, to all of you, I suppose. What do we do where we, if we don't have those kinds of agreements in place already? And this kind of goes back to the, the point that was just raised, like how, how do you prove uh, that wake effect, in fact, stems from uh, an upstream wind farm. Uh, naturally, you could just say, just as well say that, you know, it's just on account of poor wind resources today. It's not it's not windy enough, you know. Um, so if you don't have those kind of agreement in place uh, and legal conflict arise between different developers on an intrastate basis and uh international basis like how do you determine for example who shall have the burden of proof if you are claiming something how do you determine causation there's a whole plethora of different legal questions which arise in circumstances where you don't already have pre-existing bilateral and multilateral agreements in place and we should do what we can in order to avoid the, that plethora of legal questions arising and, and just as well enter into agreements already and, and try and come up with ways to fix this. We're just about to come to an end, but Stuart, did you want to come in on that one um, briefly or anyone else want to, to, to add to that? Yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy to come in on that, Tom. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point, Eric. And... I, th I think probably two things. One, I think governments um, need to be alive to this and per perhaps regulate this area, which would which will um, avoid disputes. But before that happens, I think that you know parties they either enter into a weight loss agreement where they can quantify the losses and they know exactly how much they're going to be paying out or potentially receiving, or they've got a threat of litigation, which nobody wants because nobody wants to go to court these days it's going to cost a lot of money with no guarantee of success so i think perhaps even the sort of threat of litigation might push people towards cooperating brilliant thanks very much um thanks everyone i feel like we could go on for the rest of the afternoon but i know at least two of us here have christmas parties to get to uh so <laughs> just close off by saying thank you very much to all the panelists that was a, yeah. a thank you very much for your contribution. major thanks to all of you folks thank you very and, uh, very well, very much i owe you one well done. thanks for having us if ever, if you're ever in london um on the days that mcdonald's has the two for one happy meals it's on me <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just to just to follow up, um, there's there's some questions in the Q and A which we didn't get round to. We'll try and uh, come back with some answers to the people who've asked us questions. Uh, we'll share a link to the slides uh, afterwards for those that are happy to share them, and the recording for this will be uh, uploaded onto onto YouTube, so you'll all go viral. Um, but uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a good have a good weekend.